Last week, the world's elite and other so-called stakeholders gathered in the normally sleepy Swiss town of Davos to plan the future, without input from us plebs, at the World Economic Forum's now infamous annual conference. In contrast to previous years, however, everyone was finally paying attention to what these powerful people were saying. Multiple clips from the conference have since gone viral as a result, and for good reason. So today, we're going to give you a summary of some of the most important things that were said at this year's Davos conference, or rather, the ones that the public were allowed to hear. Yes, this is a video you cannot miss. As with all Davos conferences, this one began with opening remarks from the World Economic Forum, or WEF's, president, Borger Brenda, and its founder and executive chairman, Klaus Schwab. For context, Klaus founded the WEF in order that so-called stakeholders could meet to plan the future of the world, something he once revealed in an interview. Anyways, Borger started by saying that there were over 3,000 attendees at this year's Davos conference, which was roughly the same as last year's. He acknowledged that the event is taking place amid a complex geopolitical backdrop and stressed that global cooperation is required to address truly global issues. Following a lot of predictable buzzwords, Borger stood down and Klaus stood up. He said that the purpose of the WEF's various programs is to drive global transformation and acknowledged that this transformation will be disruptive to the average person. I don't remember voting for these programs, by the way. Do you? Anyway, on that note, Klaus underscored the fact that the risks are, quote, centered on the individual and national level. In other words, the interests of individuals and countries are causing issues for the WEF's programs. He said this is a problem because, quote, we are responsible for advancing the world. Newsflash, when he says we, he doesn't mean you and me. He means the stakeholders at the WEF. Now, Klaus went on to note that the theme of this year's Davos conference was rebuilding trust, specifically rebuilding the average person's trust in the institutions the WEF controls and influences. In case you missed the memo, trust in institutions has fallen off a cliff globally since the 2020 pandemic. So this naturally begs the question of how the WEF plans to rebuild trust. Well, Klaus's answer was that it requires, quote, trusteeship, which means caring for the greater good. Put differently, setting aside your individual interests and goals in the name of some collective goal, likely one set by the WEF. Klaus then thanked the Swiss army and the Swiss police for protecting the elites from the plebs at Davos and invited Swiss president Viola Amherd on stage. She spent most of her time talking about the United Nations, or UN, calling for the organization to not only be strengthened, but also reformed. Now, if you watched our video about who controls the world, you'll know that it actually seems to be the UN. You'll also know that the WEF has partnered with the UN to ensure that the latter's Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, are met in every country by 2030, hence why you see that date everywhere. More on that in a moment. Now, Viola went on to say that fake news is the biggest threat to the WEF and said that digitizing everything can help rebuild trust because it means that the WEF can control the flow of information. Believe it or not, but she acknowledged that many people watching are not fans of the WEF. And you know what she said to that? She said it's because of plain old populism. It has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that the elites at Davos are explicitly planning global policies that disenfranchise the average person. Nope, it's populism. And she called on corporations to stop it. Not only that, but she insisted that the WEF is not at the mercy of these trends, that these trends must nevertheless be stopped, and that's what everyone at the WEF is here to do. Translation, we must retake control of the narrative before more people wake up and realize what's going on here. And speaking of which, if you're enjoying the video so far, be sure to smash that like button to give it a boost and take a second to share it so that the word gets out. Hold up a second there, guy. 
Sorry to interrupt, folks, but I just wanted to very quickly tell you about the Coin Bureau deals page. Now, this is the place where we have put together some of the very best deals and promos in all of crypto. So you can think things like exchange sign-up bonuses, trading fee discounts, and money off of hardware wallets, and much, much more besides. So if you want to check that out, coinbureau.com forward slash deals is the place to go, or you can just use the link in the description of this video down below. Thanks very much. And now back to you, Guy. Now, as you can imagine, there were a lot of speeches and panel discussions at Davos, too many for us to summarize here. For what it's worth, we went through what we believe were some of the most important ones, including many that were not reported on or even really noticed by many observers. One of these was a press conference panel where Kathy Lee, the head of the WEF's Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, announced that the WEF is building an AI that will align and enforce the UN's aforementioned SDGs. The panelists revealed that they want to use it to address crises too. FYI, the SDGs include things like the creation of digital IDs, smart cities, and central bank digital currencies, all objectively dystopian technologies that we've explained at length in previous videos. We'll leave a link to a few of those in the description if you haven't seen them already. As a cherry on top, one of the panelists insisted that AI should be ring-fenced, that is, restricted for use by only a few, and only in the name of the WEF's version of the greater good. For reference, the WEF famously predicted that we will all own nothing and be happy by 2030. That is their greater good. Anyhow, another WEF press conference that seems to have flown under the radar was the announcement by Borger himself that the WEF is working to, quote, transform global trade. It's honestly not entirely clear what's meant by this. Of course, there was lots of discussion about AI supply chains. The one thing that did catch our ear, though, was a comment by Ngozi okonjo Iweala, the director of the World Trade Organization, or WTO. She revealed that there are also efforts to reform the WTO. You'll recall that the WEF is also pushing to reform the UN, at least according to the Swiss president. Unfortunately, it's not entirely clear what these reforms entail. Fortunately, though, the panelists revealed that there will be a big announcement about it in Abu Dhabi in late February. So keep your eyes and ears peeled. But back to those dystopian technologies. Now, if you watched our video about the financial system that central banks are trying to create, you'll know they all want assets to be tokenized on centrally controlled blockchains. This could be the way in which you really do own nothing and are happy. Anyway, speculation aside, there was a panel discussion about tokenization at the WEF, which featured a few prominent voices from the crypto industry. Now, to be clear, the kind of tokenization that the crypto industry is pushing for is not the same as the one the WEF is pushing for. It's decentralized, not centralized. The caveat is that there are some institutions within the crypto industry that are not so subtly trying to introduce systems that are no less dystopian. If you watched our video about USDC issue a circle, you'll know that it appears to fall into this category. The company seems to have close connections to the WEF. That's why it's surprising that Circle CEO Jeremy Allaire pushed back on the idea of same risk, same regulation, a principle that's being used to regulate crypto and aligns with the WEF. It highlights something we've mentioned before. There seem to be tensions between powerful financial entities. From our perspective, this is why regulators like the SEC have been so nonsensical in their rulemaking. Behind the scenes, there seems to be a battle of influence between entities aligned with megabanks and entities aligned with asset managers. It's possible that there are similar tensions happening at the WEF. We actually found more circumstantial evidence of this, but we'll come back to that later. For now, though, we need to address a big feature from this year's Davos conference, and that's all the viral content that emerged from it. As it turns out, most of these clips came from speeches made by key figures. This is not surprising given that main stage events are the only ones the WEF puts on YouTube. Now, the most popular clips came from the speech given by Javier Millet, the recently elected president of Argentina. For those unfamiliar, 
Javier is a libertarian. In practice, this means he wants to minimize the government's influence on the economy and is even trying to close the country's central bank. Now, if you actually watch the speech from start to finish, though, you'll notice something odd. For starters, Klaus was the one to introduce Javier, and he was very excited to do so. Subsequent reports by major mainstream media outlets suggest that the WEF elites actually enjoyed Javier's speech. This could be a sign that it wasn't taken seriously, or that there's more to this speech than meets the eye. We'll let you be the judge of that. Whatever the case, Javier's speech was still legit. He warned that the Western world is abandoning freedom for collectivism, i.e. socialism. He went into detail about how capitalism has lifted 95% of the world out of poverty since the 1800s. He even asked, quote, does anyone voluntarily pay taxes? Javier also said a few intense things about certain social issues, which we won't repeat here for obvious reasons. In our opinion, though, the best part of Javier's speech was towards the end, where he explained exactly how it is that Western countries are becoming socialist. He admitted that the textbook definition of socialism is where the government controls the economy, and said that this isn't obvious at first glance. Upon closer inspection, however, he said that you'll realize this control is indirect and is being done primarily by regulations and central banks, namely by controlling the flow of credit. This is more accurate than you think because access to credit is becoming increasingly politicized and controlled. An easy example here is the ESG investment ideology, which has its roots in the UN's SDGs. If you watched our summary of the 2022 Davos conference, you'll know that megabanks and asset managers literally said they will not provide credit to businesses that do not comply with ESG. That is terrifying. But back to Javier's speech. Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this was the highlight of the conference. If we're talking in terms of view count, however, it appears that the highlight of the conference was in fact another set of dissenting comments made on a panel discussion, which didn't get posted to the WEF's YouTube channel. This was the panel discussion about what to expect from a Republican administration, assuming that the Republican Party wins the 2024 elections in the United States. The fact that the WEF even allowed a panel like this suggests they believe there's a real chance of this happening. Now, the panelist in question was Kevin Roberts, the president of the Heritage Foundation, a conservative US think tank. He said that the next Republican administration must reject every policy that's been proposed by the WEF and free the average citizen from the grip of the WEF's technocrats. Notably, Kevin said that the biggest geopolitical threat to the US-led world order and to freedom is China. He said that it's shocking that this is never discussed at Davos. As it so happens, China reportedly had its biggest presence at Davos in years, and this reportedly put pressure on the US to respond in kind. This ties into another Davos speech that, however, didn't get nearly as many clicks. And that was the speech by Chinese Premier Li Qiong, which happened right after the opening remarks, by the way. FYI, Premier is the second highest position that you can hold in the Chinese Communist Party. Klaus introduced Li by saying that he's, quote, no stranger to the WEF, and that it was nice to meet him at the WEF's summer event in 2023, which was titled, quote, Annual Meeting of the New Champions. We're sure this event had nothing to do with the WEF's direct influence on governments. Anyway, sarcasm aside, when Lee took to the stage, he spent quite a bit of time talking about the SDGs, particularly those related to the environment and energy. Now, this is to be expected, given that China controls most renewable energy supply chains, a fact that's also never discussed at Davos or by the mainstream media, for that matter. Not a conspiracy theory. Look it up. We'll leave a link in the description. Li went on to insist that China is worthy of trust, open for business, and is growing fast without stimulus. That last comment is particularly important because it underlines the fact that China is refusing to stimulate, despite its weak economic growth. 
something that Wall Street doesn't seem to like. Now, after Lee was finished, Klaus asked him a few questions, some of which were about AI. Lee said that AI seems kind of overhyped, a sentiment that very few other attendees seem to share. The one sentiment that Lee and the other attendees did share, however, is that AI must be controlled in the name of safety. Where have we heard that one before? Now, this relates to another Davos event that didn't get many clicks, and that was the interview with US Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Although Antony is technically fifth in command by order of presidential succession, he's been a key player in US geopolitics, being the one on the ground. Antony's comment about new technologies being potentially leveraged by hostile states seems to have been the only significant one. Everything else was talking points around the Middle East and Eastern Europe, and I'm sure you can all guess what they related to specifically. He also touched on Taiwan a couple of times. Now, the only other comment worth noting was about AI, which Antony said could be used to accelerate the SDGs, which he admitted have been lagging behind schedule. He went as far as to say that AI can solve everything from energy shortages to environmental issues, and said that NGOs need to be involved in these initiatives. Basically, your standard WEF talking points. When it comes to these WEF talking points, however, there's no bigger advocate for them than EU President Ursula von der Leyen, whose Davos speech garnered a moderate amount of interest. This probably has something to do with the fact that it was filled with enough gaslighting to keep Europe warm through the winter. Ursula started by citing the WEF's recent Global Risks Report, which noted disinformation, misinformation, and polarization as the biggest risks. By now, you'll know that disinformation and misinformation are just words for information that the elites don't want us to know, a truly Orwellian term. Naturally, she said that these risks transcend borders, so global cooperation is required. She essentially put up the EU's Digital Services Act as a template for how to address these risks. And if you watched our video about online censorship around the world, you'll know it contains some truly crazy provisions. For instance, the ability for the EU to control social media algorithms in the event of a crisis, or even just the possibility of a crisis, done using a network of de facto ministries of truth in EU countries. Incredibly, Ursula acknowledged the fact that Europe is struggling on the energy front and that European businesses aren't happy about this, including a few with representatives at Davos. She said there's a silver lining, though, and that's that Europe has become less reliant on Russia. This is arguably incorrect, however, because Europe reportedly continues to import record levels of Russian oil and gas via third countries, namely India and China, which are selling these resources at a huge markup. Some of you may have seen that the US also recently stopped exports of liquid natural gas, or LNG. And don't even get me started about how the Middle East conflict could mess up Europe's energy supply. Ursula concluded by saying that Europe will keep employing the successful strategies it's been using since the pandemic. Now, we understood this as meaning that the EU will continue to give large amounts of money to its member countries when they comply with its increasingly totalitarian rules, like a wannabe IMF. Following Ursula's speech, Klaus asked her a single question. Last year, you talked about de-risking, not decoupling. What has the progress there been like? Well, Ursula immediately began speaking about China, tacitly admitting that Europe is extremely reliant on China. This reminded us of another ironic headline. The EU is reportedly trying to stop China from exporting cheap EVs to the continent. This is ironic given that the EU is obsessed with going green. So, logically, going green would surely mean embracing these cheap EVs, not rejecting them. All this pertains to a speech given by the final boss, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. If you watched our summary of last year's Davos conference, you'll know Antonio had an absolute meltdown over the geopolitical divide and how it's slowing down the implementation of the UN's dystopian SDGs. This time, Antonio was a lot calmer and more collected, and the message was slightly different. Perhaps we're mistaken, 
but it appeared that Antonio was not so subtly slamming the US. He criticized the fact that the country continues to produce dirty energy and urged its transition to clean energy. And I'll remind you that China controls that supply chain. Moreover, Antonio called for peace in the Middle East and Eastern Europe, a radical idea these days. Make no mistake, though, the main reason Antonio wants peace is so that all countries involved can get on with the SDGs. Like the Swiss president, Antonio also wants reforms to global governance. To give his exact words, quote, Rebuilding trust requires deep reforms to global governance. Then came the Q&A, this time with Borger. And this is where Antonio's allegiances were put on full display. He explained that the global system we have today was put in place by the global north after the Second World War. However, the global south is rising, and this means we need a new global system. What's strange is Antonio said that a fragmented world is fine so long as there's, quote, global governance. Then Antonio said something that could be interpreted as justifying Russia's invasion of Ukraine, noting that the ways that borders are drawn aren't always right, but should be respected. This was in response to a question from Borger about the ongoing war in Ukraine, while he also noted that Antonio had travelled both to Kyiv and Moscow. Borg appeared visibly nervous when Antonio made that comment about borders, and it fits into something we mentioned in our video about the UN. Put simply, it looks like the US and China are fighting for control of the UN. In that aforementioned video, we speculated that the UN's interests would start to align more with the Global South in the coming years as a result. In retrospect, though, it looks like this process could already be in place. As we mentioned in that video, this could be a double-edged sword. While it means that US-led initiatives like the SDGs would fall by the wayside, a Chinese-led UN could usher in even more dystopian initiatives. After all, China isn't exactly known for its commitment to freedom and autonomy. And this brings us to what we believe were the three most important discussions at this year's Davos conference. All three were related to something that's going to be front and centre for the rest of the year, and that's freedom of speech, or rather, the lack thereof, ahead of many major national elections. In case you haven't noticed, governments around the world have been justifying their online censorship in the name of safety, protecting the vulnerable. Lo and behold, one of the panel discussions at the WEF was titled, quote, Protecting the Vulnerable Online. What was said was nothing short of insane. As expected, the moderator began by citing the WEF's Global Risks Report, which you'll recall had misinformation and disinformation at the top of the list. The moderator said these risks will grow because of AI and that the only solution to protecting the vulnerable is international regulations. Now, if you thought that this just applied to protecting children online, like the description of the event says, you'd be dead wrong. A few minutes later, Maurice Levy, the chairman of Publicis Group, a French advertising agency, said that everyone on the internet is vulnerable, even those who just use email. He seemed to take issue with the fact that the US Constitution would prevent EU-style online regulations from being implemented globally. I'll remind you that these involve giving EU governments the power to control what you see online in the event of a crisis, or even just the possibility of a crisis, indefinitely. Now here is where things get interesting. Morris said he once spoke about his online censorship obsessions with the leaders of the G8 countries. Back then, Angela Merkel was still the Chancellor of Germany, and she said she was scared of implementing these kind of rules because the population could revolt. More accurately, she was scared that 5% of the population would revolt. Why is this significant? Well, it's estimated that you only need around 3.5% of the population to topple a dictator. This is presumably why Angela was scared about just 5% of the population pushing back against her government's policies. Let's remember that one, shall we? Now, if you thought all that was insane, consider this. Julie Grant, who heads the Australian government's e-safety department, 
revealed that she's in the process of putting together a, quote, global online safety regulators network, which will seek to impose EU-style online censorship regulations around the world. Meanwhile, Morris bragged about pressuring advertisers to pull funding from social media companies, such as X, that refuse to fall in line with these censorship laws. Helena Laurent, the head of a UK organisation obsessed with online safety, lamented the fact that only 60% of countries have such laws. Before the clock ran out, Helena managed to drop a bombshell, and that's that the WEF doesn't seem to be keen on talking about the more than $1 trillion that are lost to online scams every year. Maurice also squeezed in another dystopian soundbite. He wants everyone online to be a safe box. Did you hear anything about actually protecting vulnerable people online in all of this? Nope, neither did we. Now, this ties into the second censorship-related panel discussion, which was titled, quote, Where is freedom of expression going? The short answer is that it's not going to a place any of us want it to go to. The worst part of all is that the elites are gaslighting us into thinking that we're the ones at fault here. This was the impression that we got from watching the initial speech by Tirana Hassan, the director of Human Rights Watch. She effectively said that the censorship of content that many people find obscene is a slippery slope towards outright censorship, which, to be fair, could be argued under some circumstances. She also slammed Salvadoran President Najib Bukele for imprisoning so many people, even though the measure has resulted in the lowest murder rate in the country for over 30 years, as per mainstream media reports. Now, don't get us wrong, Najib has his faults, but lowering crime by locking up criminals isn't one of them. Then came the panel discussion, where Belarusian politician Sviatlana Sikhanuskaya said that people in her country can't say how they truly feel without getting in trouble with the government. What's fascinating is that the description of the WEF's video about the discussion notes Sviatlana as being the president-elect of Belarus, implying she's about to become president. This is fascinating given that Belarus will be having elections at the end of February. Does the WEF know something we don't? Whatever the case, the most eye-opening part of this discussion was an audience question about Sri Lanka's online safety bill. As with all other online safety bills, the true purpose of this bill is to censor all opposition. Tirana tacitly admitted this to be true, but didn't acknowledge it's happening everywhere. Sri Lanka's online safety bill became law a few days later, for anyone wondering. It's also worth remembering that Sri Lanka once had the highest ESG score of any country before it collapsed, meaning it was the most SDG compliant. It looks like the WEF is looking to build back better, as the elites like to say. This relates to the third panel discussion about free speech, and that was, quote, protecting democracy against bots and plots. It goes without saying that bots and plots are not good for democracy, but neither is using these as an excuse to crack down on legitimate dissent, as we've seen in the past. Once again, the moderator began by saying that misinformation and disinformation are the greatest risks, according to the WEF, and that they will be amplified by AI. Alexandra Givens of the Center for Democracy and Technology wasted no time explaining that trusted information must be promoted. And that's not all. She wants all US politicians to have their websites hosted by the government when they're campaigning. She added that the 2016 election taught big tech how to intervene when there's misinformation and disinformation online. We'll leave an article about that in the description. Next up was Jan Lipavsky, the Czech Minister of Foreign Affairs, who was treated with relative disrespect by the moderator and the panel. This might have something to do with the fact that he revealed that Russia has been funding radical left-wing groups, not just radical right-wing groups. I'll quickly note that there have been numerous reports of Russia funding radical environmental groups too, something that fits hand-in-glove with China's control of renewable energy supply chains. It's almost like the two countries are working together to trick the US and its allies into becoming reliant on them. Wouldn't that be wild? 
Matthew Prince, the co-founder and CEO of Cloudflare, also caused a stir when he said that it won't be possible for the government to regulate AI's outputs. Yan was very dissatisfied with this statement and insisted that the government must have this control. Gives you an idea of what's happening in Czechia. Amazingly, Alexandra chimed in to defend Matthew by saying that giving the government this kind of power is overkill and could lead to a technological dystopia. This is probably why Alexandra was looking angrily at Smithri Zubin Irani, an Indian foreign minister who arrived late to the panel. That's because Smriti bragged about everything in India being digitized and closely monitored and controlled by the government, including voting, social media activity, and soon AI content. She said it's the best kind of democracy. The moderator asked if there were enough checks and balances. Smriti said it's fine. Now, to wrap things up, I want to summarize one more important panel discussion that relates to what we believe was the real theme of this year's Davos conference, ensuring that the outcomes of all the elections around the world in 2024 align with the WEF's goals, which are partially rooted in the UN's SDGs. This might sound silly, but it seems that the attendees at this year's Davos conference had one thing in common. They were all mortified at the possibility that Donald Trump could become US president again later this year. That's because they know he would defund the WEF, the UN, and all these other organizations. Case in point, Trump was front and center during the final panel discussion about the global economic outlook. All the panelists agreed that a Trump presidency would create significant uncertainty in the markets due to the political and geopolitical implications it would have. They don't want it to happen. But that's not the panel discussion we're going to summarize here, though you should watch it. It's also insane and reveals that there are significant tensions within the EU and other such organizations. No, the panel discussion we're going to summarize was titled, quote, 4.2 billion people at the ballot box. Now, clips from this panel discussion have likewise gone viral, but these viral clips only scratch the surface of what was said. One of the panelists was author Rachel Botsman, and she made two very astute observations. The first was that trust in institutions is at a record low since the pandemic, as we said earlier. The second was that this trust hasn't disappeared, it's just been redirected. Rather than trusting centralized institutions of power, people are putting their trust in decentralized structures. We would go as far as to say that the growing adoption of crypto is a part of this trust trend Rachel has rightly identified. To Rachel's credit, she admitted that this change in trust is going to make it extremely difficult for governments to control information. That's an understatement. The more that governments try to control information, the less that people will trust them, something the elites don't seem to understand. Another panelist, meanwhile, was Alexander Soros, the chair of the controversial Open Society Foundation and the grandson of the even more controversial billionaire George Soros. Clips of Alexander have gone viral too, which is annoying because he didn't really say anything of substance. He's not a very good speaker. On the other hand, Grandpa George has a history of being a very effective investor and influencer, and not in the silly social media way. Just recently, it was reported that George is investing millions of dollars into community groups across Texas to try and flip the state blue during the 2024 election. Food for thought. Now, a third panelist, Mark Leonard, the director of the European Council on Foreign Relations, seemed to sum up the sentiment of almost every Davos panel discussion we watched. The 2024 US election will have a global impact, and the, quote, technocratic imperative is being stopped by populism. Let me repeat that. The technocratic imperative, that is, the will of the WEF and its allies, is being stopped by populism, that is, the will of the people who support candidates the WEF hates. Now, this is in fact a convenient statement because it includes the solution we've all been looking for. This year, vote for people who oppose the WEF, regardless of their political leanings. To be clear, 
This is not an endorsement of any political candidate or party. It's an endorsement of the freedom that's slowly being taken away from us by unelected and unaccountable individuals and institutions like the WEF and its stakeholders. If we play our cards right this year, we may just be able to wrestle ourselves out of their hands. Let's hope we can before it's too late. OK, that's all for today's video. So if you found it informative, smash that like button to let us know. If you want to stay informed, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell. If you want to help inform others, take a second to share this video with them. If you happen to be into crypto, then be sure to check out the Coin Bureau Deals page. It's got trading fee discounts of up to 60% and sign up bonuses of up to $50,000 on the best crypto exchanges and discounts on the best hardware wallets too. The link is in the description. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. This is Guy, signing off.